Hey everyone, lunch time and you're here with me. So cool, thanks. Did you all get something to eat at least, snack on or maybe lunch plans afterwards? All right, good. No, no lunch plans for that guy. <laughs> this is more important than lunch. It's good. So my name is Matt DiNapoli. Um, welcome to the intro to API security. It is an intro, but um, some of the things we're gonna talk about are very important because uh, this is the first step in using APIs. Um, you may have been in the 101 class this morning where I gave an introduction to uh, REST APIs, talked about what they were, how to use them, all of that fun stuff. And we kind of glossed over the security part. Um, and you know, I feel like we kind of made a mistake for um, maybe a year or so in teaching these classes because we weren't giving the security portion the gravity that it deserved. Um, <clears throat> One of the hardest things to do in starting to work with an API is figure out how to access it and continue to access it while your application is running. Um, so I felt that there was a need to talk about the types that at least we come in, in contact with and that we think you guys will run into. Um, so that's why I've, I've put this session together because I think it gets everyone over that first hump. It's really easy to make an API call, but unless you uh, don't have access to it, then it becomes a little confusing. Why isn't this working? So, and uh, some of the standardizations that are um, coming into place are a little bit complicated. I don't think they're too daunting, but they're something that, if with a little explanation, can be something that, that is accessible to you. So, <clears throat> that's the intro. I'm going to give a little discussion about authentication versus authorization, um, just to give you guys context around um, what it means to be able to make an API call versus the data that's coming back and all of that. Um, and then we'll go into three different types of API authorization and authentication um, because uh, these are the ones that either are used in Cisco product that we talk about or um, something that you might see in general in the, in the industry. So we'll talk about basic authentication, token authentication, and OAuth 2. So, API security, why is it important? You guys are all probably network engineers or deal with network engineers or application developers. Data is, um, when, you, when you open up an API layer to an application, the data becomes very accessible. Um, you have literally very specific calls that are asking for data or manipulating data. We're, go we're gonna change some information, we're gonna delete some information. So that provides a number of more endpoints for um, God, I hate the term hackers, but that's really what it is, hackers to access your content, right? And potentially, if you're giving them the ability to not just get potentially sensitive content, uh, but to be able to delete it, to be able to change it, that can cause some problems for either a business or individual that are potentially irreparable. So security, for obvious reasons, is very important, right? <clears throat> um, oh, the other thing, excuse me, so it's not just the data, uh, the data in question that's the problem. These APIs use resources, right? There's um, bandwidth that has to be worried about, there's storage that has to be worried about, there are servers that are running that have to be worried about. And if an API isn't properly secured, then we might run into a situation where a malicious party might be looking to bring down a, bring down a service and send a bunch of API requests as fast as it possibly can in a service asking for large amounts of data to come back. And if anyone has experience with APIs, if you're asking for, um, you know, potentially, uh, one example I had yesterday, um, I was looking for all of the rooms that our Devi bot was in, right? And uh, I think it's in around 600 or so rooms. And I didn't know what the number was, so I just set it high. Um, so it took about, I don't know, 15 or 20 seconds for that API call to run. That's a long time. Um, and had I set that number even higher, um, I would have been able to, uh, you know, I'd not probably bring down Spark because it's set up not to do that. But it takes that, it, it, you know, my gateway might shut down. I might be able to crash that service. So there is a very valid physical reason as well to make sure that your APIs are secure. So um, authentication versus authorization. Excuse me one second. Um, authentication and authorization are mistakenly used interchangeably. They're not the same thing. Authentication is saying, I am me. Um, I'm Matt DiNapoli. My email address is what it is. 
Um, you know, my Facebook profile has a certain uh, application to it. And so that's indicating um, that I, I am who I am. Um, authorization, on the other hand, might be tied into authentication, but it's not the same thing. It's saying what I'm allowed to do. And so when we're talking about these things, there needs to be a specific delineation. And we'll see why um, uh, later when we talk about OAuth 2. But I, I just want to make sure that there's, there's an understanding between the two things that they are different. Um, some other notions we need to understand is federation. Um, so if you are authorized to do something, where are you authorized to do it? So if you think about a scenario, and I'm sure you all work for companies that support single sign-on, um, uh, we at Cisco have a number of different uh, web properties that we need access to with um, potentially uh, user management systems. And we are able to use our um, internal credentials to access all of those systems without having to either re-log in or um, go through another set of credentials. So uh, that's where federation comes into place. And then finally, delegation. Um, so federation and delegation go hand in hand because of those other web properties. So we're federating across those web properties and the service that's doing the authorization is trusting that, that they can go out and do anything that they want in those other services so they don't have to worry about, um, so if I'm, if I'm logged into Cisco Spark but I also want to log into developer.cisco.com, um, Cisco Spark doesn't care what I'm doing in developer.cisco.com. It's just authorized me to do that. So um, that's actually not true, but that's the example that I'm giving right now off the top of my head. So anyways, that's the delegation portion of it. So federation and delegation are tightly coupled in that instance. Does that make sense? Any questions there? If you guys have any questions, my colleague Paul is sitting up here. He, can, he may have a mic. So if you're running around and you need it, some information, just feel free to ask. OK, so the first method we're going to talk about is basic authentication and authorization. A lot of the APIs that we use um, leverage this. It's very easy to understand. Um, it's <coughs> it's uh, well formed. It's a standardization. There are libraries that support it specifically in almost all the programming languages. And so um, it makes it very easy. It's used mainly for kind of on-premise situations. And the reason being is that you have to set up user credentials on the service to allow for API calls. So in this instance, basic authentication and authorization, you'll notice that it has both words up there. And there's a very specific reason why. Um, and it's because you do set up those credentials to do that. So it's authorizing and saying that you are that person. You're allowed to do this in who you are. So anyways, um, the process is the application makes a request to the service for the API. Um, the service can come back and say, hold on a second, I need your credentials. You send that, or the application sends that over in, in a base64 encoded string that includes the username, a colon, and then a, the password. Um, and then it sends that over, and then the service says, all right, that's cool. Now, usually what you do with the API call is then bunch that all together. Uh, so it's in one call you say, I want to use this API. Here's my, here are my basic credentials. And it comes back, and if everything's kosher, it says, all right, we're, we're good to go. And um, here's the content that you asked for. So I'm going to do a little demo and show you how that works um, for Cisco CMX. Excuse me one second. I got to turn my notifications off. All right. So if we go into our Postman client, I'm going to make this a little bigger so you can see it. So in this instance, I'm calling the API. If you guys are, uh, hopefully you guys are familiar with REST clients. This is a REST client called Postman. It allows us to make API calls um, and set up uh, our headers and set up our query parameters, uh, examine the data that comes back. So this is what I'm using to make these API calls. Um, and so in this instance, I want to get information from the mobility services engine in CMX. Um, about the clients. So let's just say I forgot to spell my name right, and, or my username right, and I sent that along to this service. It'll tell me that I'm 401, and that's the error that we have over to the left here. 401 error while authenticating user. <clears throat> and what's that telling me is my credentials aren't valid. 
So, oh, look, I made a typo. I did, the username is learning. I should probably put that in there. We'll update the request, and everything is a okay. So, you're probably sitting there going, this was pretty easy. This is just how I log into all the stuff that I log into every day. Makes sense, right? All right, cool. So, there is a, there's a reason I'm showing you this, though, and it's because when we get to the hard part, um, the, the base plays into it. So, stick with me, I promise. It'll get more interesting. Um, so, that's basic. Any questions about that? Very straightforward. Thing to keep in mind is um, it requires user credentials to be set up in the service. And the main thing to make it most secure is it has to be running over HTTPS. Um, if it's running over HTTP, it's not encrypted. And um, potentially a man in the middle could poach your credentials. And it's a very easy decode. Um, since it's base64 encoded, it's a standardized uh, uh, decode and you could easily get your credentials to the system. So it has to be over HTTPS for it to be secure. You should be using HTTPS anyways, no matter what, <laughs> but <laughs> in that instance. Um, so that was that demo. All right, now we have the second one. It's called token. Uh, token is not, a, there's no standardization for token. It's kind of left up. Uh, the implementation is kind of left up to the designer of the API. Um, so, for example, uh, that we're going to see our APIC EM controller leverages a token type system. They call it tickets, um, but uh, it's essentially a token. And so, the way that the process works is the application or service makes, or the application makes a request to the service for a token, leveraging something that's an identifying factor. So, there is authentication and authorization in this as well. We still have user um, name and password credentials set up on this service to allow this. So you're going to send that over to, um, you're going to send those credentials over to the service, ask for a ticket back, and then if you're validated, then the ticket will be sent back, allowing you to make API calls with it after that. Now, this is a little more secure than basic because um, that ticket has a, an expiration date. There are some management things you can put around that, that ticket. Um, and again, this is totally up to the service uh, to implement the validation and the expiration date and all that stuff. There is no real standard around this. And so in the instance of APIC-EM, they have a, a, a token timeout. And so if I were to use a token that I created yesterday for this, it, would, it should fail. Um, if I make any API calls. Again, but this still has to go over HTTPS. And as we'll see, we actually have to send our credentials um, through, through uh, JSON as a post. So it could potentially, if you're not over HTTPS, you could actually see these in the clear. You wouldn't even need to do the decode to figure that out. Um, so again, you still have to do um, HTTPS to make this very secure, or at least secure enough to be usable. So anyways, we'll do a little quick demo of that with APIC EM. So this is our APIC EM service. Um, now, through the documentation, I know that I need to send a post to this particular endpoint um, slash ticket, and that it's going to give me something back that I can use. And so we'll, uh, sorry, I need to show you the credentials too. So, and it tells me that I need to send over JSON formatted with username. Um, and then in this instance, it's devnet user and then password. Um, if my JSON's malformatted, I'll get a um, 400 or a 4, yeah, uh, 400 or a 403 or something like that. Um, so it has to be formatted that way. Otherwise, the API will not accept it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a ticket. And it comes back really fast. It gives me a service ticket. Um, so if I'm writing an application, the first API call I'll do is I'll make a get ticket type call. And I'll include that API. And I'll grab that ticket, parse it out of that JSON, and then hold on to it as a variable in my application and keep popping that in every time I make an API call. Maybe I'm looping through a uh, set of hosts, or I want to get the network hosts, and I want to get the network devices, and I'm making two different API calls. And, and so um, in each of those calls, I would leverage this particular service ticket. Now. Um, uh, I didn't queue up the other API call that I wanted to do. Hold on one sec. So if I want to get that list of hosts, it would lead us to believe that we need to use the service ticket to do that. So um, in our headers for this particular service, and the documentation will tell us this. So there might be APIs that require that you put that token 
at the end of the URL, or it might be a different header. Uh, in the documentation for the APIC-EM APIs, it's telling me I need to set this header X auth token to whatever that service ticket is that they gave me, right? So um, in this instance, uh, we will, we'll, we'll just see what happens if I don't put that new ticket in. All right, so this is the one I did yesterday, not recognized, and that's because it expired, and the service that manages and validates the tickets got rid of it. So I can no longer use the ticket from yesterday to make the API calls that I'm going to make today. Makes sense, right? OK. So uh, <clears throat> if I wa do want to make the API calls now, though, that's not what I want. We're going to go back to this one, grab our service ticket. Pop it in here, send, and we get our API call back very quickly. Everything is all good and ready to go. We get our list of hosts and all the information that comes along with it. OK. So that was all the easy stuff. All right, this is, this is good. We're good. All right. We rushed through that because OAuth is, is interesting. So we're going to get into OAuth. And the reason that we spend so much time on OAuth is that it's becoming the de facto standard for um, API authentication. Anytime that you log into Facebook, anytime that you or log into an application that says, can I use your Facebook credentials or your Google credentials to log in, it's leveraging OAuth. Um, and what it's saying is, um, I as a service, if Facebook says you're OK, then I'm going to allow you to use my service. So um, obviously, if you're in a situation where uh, you're managing protected information. You're not going to leverage Facebook as your OAuth service. But you've seen instances where it says log in with Facebook uh, or log in with Google or log in with Twitter. Um, and that's instances of OAuth too. Okay? So that being said, it is technically not an authentication protocol. Um, it's actually not a protocol at all. It's more of a framework. Um, OAuth 1.0, which I'm not going to really talk about too much, um, was a protocol. Um, apparently, though, the part, the, it was a very hard protocol to implement for services. And so um, it was apparently very secure, um, and people liked it that were able to implement it, but it was very hard to implement and took a lot of time. OAuth 2 was devised um, in a way such that it was easier to implement, but arguably um, it made it a little less secure than OAuth 1. That all being said, no one really uses OAuth 1.0 anymore. Um, I mean, there are services that still do, and if you run into that instance, you know, you can research that. Um, but OAuth 2 is becoming more and more standardized as we go forward. Um, so it is a framework. It's not a protocol. And the reason that it's more of a framework is that there are different options that it gives the implementer the ability to do. Um, it does leverage the notion of tokens, um, but the way you validate those tokens isn't standardized. Um, and so, hence, it is decidedly called a framework rather than a protocol. Um, then, now, the nice thing that you do get from OAuth 2 that we didn't see with basic or um, token, the token method was an inherent federation and delegation. So, I can only log into APIC-EM with those credentials. Yeah, I might set them up on another service, but that would be those services' credentials. Same thing with CMX. That user exists on that CMX service only. So there's no federation, no delegation going on there. It's a one-to-one -one credential. With OAuth, too, because you're potentially leveraging other authorization sources, there's inherent federation and delegation. You can implement SSO across a number of different properties, um, by leveraging the same login service because it, doesn't, um, it allows you to use one authorization service and spread that out over whatever application you want. Um, and then because, of, because you're getting federation, you're inherently getting delegation as well. Um, there is two-legged authorization. That's kind of like the basic service, password and a username and password going back and forth. That's the boring stuff. The interesting thing is the, um, the three-legged authorization. And that's kind of the example we're going to show here uh, using Cisco Spark. Um, and then all of the information that I have here that I'm presenting to you, I poached from um, a DigitalOcean article about OAuth2. And I actually 
had kind of gone through a bunch of different tutorials to find out what was good, make sure that I understand all the nuances, and that one ended up being the most clear and understandable. So if you find yourself in a, in a situation where you want to understand a little better, I think this tutorial is excellent. Um, so take a picture of it or write it down. Um, I should have pointed that link out earlier so you could have wrote, written it down quickly. Or you can come up to me afterwards and I'll give it to you. Um, but that's, that's a really good tutorial for this. Um, one of the challenging things with dealing with OAuth 2 is they made up their own vernacular. Um, and it kind of fits with the way you think about it. But some things are a little confusing, which is why I have this particular slide up here. Um, first of all, we have the resource owner. That's you sitting at your, your desktop. That's the actual user. Um, and then we have the client, which is the application that will be accessing the content. Um, and then we have our authorization server. And this could be, um, as I was saying before, it could be Facebook, could be Google, could be some auth, OAuth server that you're managing. Um, it, and so that's the thing that's saying, all right, uh, these credentials are good and you're authorized to access this. And then finally, we have our resource server, which is the actual API call, the actual service that's providing the content back to um, the client and then ultimately to the resource owner. So that's the, those are the, as you read through the, the content for OAuth 2, these um, particular words are used very specifically. So this is the general flow. Um, the first step, and, and I say this is the general flow because there are different flavors to OAuth 2. Um, we're going to talk about two out of the four of them. Um, the first one is going to be authorization code, and we'll see that in a second. Uh, the second one's called implicit, and I'll describe the main difference between the two. Um, but the general idea, it's a kind of a two-way handshake kind of thing. The application, which has registered with the authorization server, um, uh, makes a request on behalf of the user, or actually makes a request of the user, excuse me, for an authorization grant. So when you do use those credentials, you might see a screen pop up that says, um, you know, your application wants to use your Facebook credentials and get this information from it. And you say, OK, that's fine. You know, it, I don't, I'm not worried about that. So that's that authorization grant portion. So um, that's when you actually do the login on your side. Um, and then it sends that authorization grant back to the application. And it then makes, the application makes a request to the authorization server for an access token. And that access token is the key. That's the thing that allows us to make those API calls then going forward. Um, so it's, uh, then they use the access token to make the API calls. And then the protected resource is the thing that comes back. That's your API data that, that's going to come back. So um, some more terms we want to kind of go through. Uh, you do have to usually register an application. Well, you do have to register an application um, with the authorization service to um, to be able to use it. So if you were going to integrate with Twitter for some reason um, to uh, leverage their OAuth service, uh, you would then have to register your application with them. Um, this then generates a client ID and a client secret. And we'll see how those are used, uh, particularly uh, for Spark, to generate our um, authorization codes and then our access tokens. Um, and then. There are four types of authorization grants. Um, so we have authorization code. Um, that's the one that Spark uses. And that's the one that I've seen pretty consistently. Um, I don't think, I think I've seen implicit once, and I'm blanking on where that was. Um, and then the resource owner password and credentials is even less secure than um, sending uh, Oh, it is over HTTPS, but it's, it's about the same as doing a basic or a token management where you're sending the user credentials actually in the URL. Um, and then finally is client credentials. And from what I understand, that's more for server-to-server um, uh, -server discussions that are behind a firewall. So we won't even bother with that because that's not dealing with APIs that we're worried about. So um, those are the four different types of authorization grant. And again, that DigitalOcean article gets in them in more detail. And it's really good about um, telling us how to use them and for what. So this is the authorization code flow. This is the one that we're going to see with the Spark implementation. Um, so it's a derivative of that standard uh, diagram that we saw before. 
the user makes a request through the user agent, and in most instances, it's going to be a browser. It could be, um, it could be an application like Spark, a desktop application like Spark. Um, the user authorizes the, uh, the user authorizes the application by putting in their credentials, logging them in. Um, the authorization server then sends an, an authorization code. Uh, it's, back to the application, and that authorization code is usually only valid uh, for a short period of time. Um, it, manages, uh, it manages that, so that, that, if that authorization code existed forever, then you know, it could get out into the ether and be used to leverage to get the access token, which is really the thing that you want. Uh, we're doing all of this work to get to the access token, so we can then make API calls against our service. So, um, not not too far of a departure from the, what we saw in the standard diagram, uh, but it's very explicit in that it has to go through that. Now, I said explicit for a reason, because the implicit flow puts a little bit of trust into the user or the application making the call. Um, and this is the, the, a decision-making point for those providing the service if they should allow an implicit flow. It might be a service that you're managing with another team and it's in-house and everything's cool and you don't have to worry about it. For a cloud-based um, application or a cloud service that you'd be providing to a public audience, I would recommend doing the previous one, the authorization code, rather than implicit. Um, but in implicit, it takes that initial, um, <clears throat> It takes that authorization code step out, uh, so you don't have to go through the process of getting it. And you send along your um, you send along your client ID in the um, initial request for the authorization grant, and it immediately sends you back an access token um, in the URI. So um, it's a little lighter. It's a lighter weight version of OAuth 2, and I would argue probably a little less secure. Um, but I've, I have seen it implemented in ways that you can, that you can use it. Um, but anyway, so I just wanted to mention it so you're aware that it's something that's there, but we're not going to deal with that at all. So getting into the demo. We have. We should be good. We have plenty of time. Are there any questions before we get into the demo? Okay, I think we're good there. So I'm leveraging Cisco Spark. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is the documentation. So um, that can be found at developer.ciscospark.com. And the information on how to on how to um, integrate with the Spark application is found in the Getting Started. Um, if you go to the left here, it'll say Integrations OAuth, and it'll tell us what we actually need to do to integrate directly with um, with Spark. And this is a pretty common page for not in the layout and the format, but it, there there is usually a an access page, a how do I authorize, how do I, you know, how do I, how am I able to use the API for almost, or actually for every API you come across, especially ones that are cloud services, um, because they want you to use their APIs, so they're going to give you the information on how to access them. <clears throat> um, there is a little discussion about OAuth 2 in here, because not everyone understands what it is. Um, and then it walks through the steps, basically, that we saw before. Um, we're going to make a request to our authorized URL to um, get the uh, authorization code. And then we're going to use that authorization code to request our access token. And then once we get our access token, we can pop that into our API calls. And it also tells us how we even set that up as well. So um, I already know the documentation, so I'm going to just walk through how it's explained. And you guys can see that. So if I'm building an application for Spark that I want to integrate with it, I'm going to build, um, I'm going to go over to my apps. And uh, in this instance, I've already built one out, so you guys don't have to see me type. Uh, but I'm going to, you, if you're creating a new one, you'd hit Add App. In this instance, I'm just going to edit this app. I don't know why I picked the name Darla. I did it yesterday. So I have Darla Spark app. Um, this is my Spark app. This is an email address that I can use for support. It requires an app icon. Actually, finding a valid uh, icon is one of the harder parts of setting up this demo. Um, I've been using my colleague Adrian's uh, little, little cat there. Um, and then that's the redirect URI. Now, I'm going to be leveraging um, 
Postman as my application, your redirect URI is going to be the application that you build, your web service that you build. Um, so it's going to be expecting um, in this, your application to leverage OAuth would be expecting a callback from the OAuth service so it can get that um, authorization code and then ultimately that access token. So there's got to be an endpoint in your application that expects that is listening for and expects this information to come back. So in this instance, it's um, because my application in this is Postman, uh, they give us a specific URL that we're allowed to use to test these things out. Um, they were nice enough to do that. So that's great. Uh, we also set our scopes. Um, you'll see this a lot of times whenever you log into a application using OAuth. Um, uh, a lot of times it happens for me with Google, it'll say, you know, this application wants to use your Google email address and this to, to uh, allow you to log in and you say OK or whatever. Um, so in this instance, we're allowing this particular application to read rooms um, from a particular user as they're, as they're going forward. And you say that's OK. So we set all those. Um, when you create a new one, this second part is created. And that gives you your OAuth settings. So that gives us the client ID. Um, and then the client secret. Had I created a new one, we'd see a secret box there as well. Um, if I wanted to regenerate it, I would. I'm not going to because I have the demo working with that particular secret, and I'd have to change it. Um, the nice thing that they give you, and not all the, the documentation will give you this, but they give you the kickoff point, the authorization URL that will get you started in this, um, in this process to go out to get that authorization code to then make the request for the access token. So we're actually going to see this all in play um, now that we have it all, all our application set up. So grab that URL. Now in your app, I'm just going to run this in the browser um, because uh, Postman has a way to get your, um, and I'll actually show it to you guys real quick so you can see it. But um, that's not Postman. Um, there is a way, if you go into the authorization section, if you go to OAuth2 and you click on new access token, it asks for all of the different fields that you need to get your access token. Let me see if I can make it bigger before I do that. Yeah. Um, for some reason, this process isn't working. I haven't debugged why that is yet. Um, but uh, it asks for the token name. That's just for their internal usage. But it's asking for the auth URL. That's that first URL that we were given after we created our application. And then the access token URL. And I think that's probably the reason, the shortcoming to this process, why it's not working anymore. Um, but the access token URL and how it's formatted is described in the authentication documentation. And then we have our client ID and our client secret. Uh, being passed along as well. And so what Postman does when this works properly is it formats everything in a necessary fashion so that you can get all of your um, authorization codes and access tokens back properly. Uh, it's not working that way. So this first auth URL portion I'm going to do using uh, the browser <coughs> or not. Oh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> it lets me go to the browser. What the hell? <clears throat> Sorry about this. Nope. Mac issues. It's really small on my screen, so I'm having trouble seeing it. <laughs> Apologies, one second here. There we go. OK. So uh, again, what I'm, what I'm posting is this authorization URL. And what I'm expecting to get back is that's cool, because you've registered this application and we've accepted it. Um, in this instance, I should note, I've registered this application with this service. They have an auto accept. And they generate the client ID and the client secret. There might be a lot of instances where um, you'll come across an application that you want to register against where there's an admin on the other side that says, all right, I'll generate your OAuth client and secret for you, and it's not automatically done. Um, this is a cloud service that we want people to integrate with as much as possible, so we just let everybody through. So um, that's not always the case. 
But anyway, so I've, I've um, copied my authorization URL. I'm going to run that. <coughs> it's going to ask me to sign into Cisco Spark. This is that, that, hey, allow Cisco Spark to, or allow this application to use your Cisco Spark credentials. So I'm going to log in. Hopefully everything works properly. Okay. Okay. Cool. So um, it authorized me, and or it's asking asking for the authorization code. It it, it authenticated me. Spark authenticated me, um, and so it's asking if I can list the titles of the room that I'm in. All right. That sounds good. Um, let's accept it. And then I get a blank screen back because this is happening outside of my application. Um, but the thing that is happening that I want to show you guys is, well, let's see here. <laughs> we'll go into notes, and I'll blow it up so you can see it. See, I already did that there. So it's going to my callback, um, and then it's giving me this value code. So this is the authorization code. I've now completed the first step to uh, be able to get my access token. We're not there yet. So I have a code now to now request an access token. So we did the first handshake. So I'm going to grab that code, and now I'm going to hop into Postman. And through the documentation, I have found out that I need to do a post to the Spark API to get my access token to then make the rest of the API requests, OK? So what I'm going to do is pop this code into the code parameter. And all of these parameters that I have here, grant type, client ID, client secret code, how they're formatted, what they need to be, all of that stuff is covered in the documentation as well. It'll say. Very specifically, actually, it says the redirect URI has to match the one that you initially made the author authorization code request for. Um, otherwise, it won't allow you to get your access token. Um, the client ID has to be valid. The client secret has to be valid. And the grant type specifically has to be authorization code, authorization underscore code. <coughs> Excuse me. So assuming that we have, oh, and it also tells me that I need to send it as a post. But the body is not JSON or anything like that. It's um, what's called a XWWW form uh, URL enclosed. It's essentially telling the service that I'm sending the content that you're asking for in the URL, so don't look for it anywhere else. Uh, so that's what we're doing there. And you can set that if you want to follow along in the body section. Um, usually we send raw JSON over um, in, the, in the payload. Uh, but in this instance, I'm sending that content in the URL. So that's why I selected the URL form URL and code there. Um, so I th I'm pretty sure everything's right. So we're going to cross our fingers, kick it off, and it, now I have an access token. Now I can make API calls. That gave it back. And then it expires in, I'm guessing this is milliseconds. Thank you. I'm guessing this is milliseconds. Um, so um, I know that that expiration's there. I'll probably set up a timer off of that, uh, that code. And then it gives me a refresh token. So I don't need to go through that handshake process anymore. So I can take that refresh token at you know, one second before that it, this expires and get a new one. Or you know, I'd probably set it for less than that. Uh, but I can then only make that one call, uh, API call, to get the refresh token. Or to use the refresh token to get a new access token. Excuse me. Um, so everything was good. We got our access token. Let's make sure we can make API calls with it. So we're going to grab that. And if your application, you know, you're saving this to a variable, right? Uh, so let's see here. I'm going to api.cisco.spark. So we have our um, we have our token now. Uh, we don't need to go through the authorization process here, but we do want to set our header. Um, 
in the pretty much standard, it's, we saw it with our other two instances, we're setting the, the authorization header in this instance. Um, but now we're setting it to a value bare space and then the token that we just created. Now, I'm going to try and run this with, this might be the old token I created yesterday, and I, if it is, then I should get an error or I'm not authorized. All right, that's probably some other developer token. Um, we'll, we'll pop in the one that we just created. And that one should work as well, and it does, and we're happy about that. If there was a typo in this or the token was invalid, um, you know, we would get a 401 unauthorized. You're not allowed to make these API calls. So uh, we see that that worked, and our, our, our two-way handshake worked, and that we got our access token and we're able to make API calls with that. Um, now that, will, that code will expire and, you know, tomorrow, and I won't be able to use it anymore. So... Um, let me make sure that I covered everything I wanted to cover because I think we're good. And I'll get you guys out of here three minutes early. Yeah, we're good there. Um, so before we get finished, are there any questions specific to what we did here? Yes. Um, so for that particular token, it won't let me because um, I only set the scopes for rooms. Yeah, so... Um, I think you'd probably get a 401 unauthorized. Or, yeah, I think, yeah, you get a 401 unauthorized. So the question was, remember I set those scopes earlier and I only set for rooms. Um, if I were to run another API call for a different endpoint against this, I should get it. I should get an error. Um, I haven't tried that, and I'm a little nervous that it's going to not work. <laughs> um, so we'll just let it go. But it, that sh it should work that way. Um, I'll, I'll cue that up for the next time. Uh, so good question. Uh, anything, anything else? <coughs> Excuse me. All right, cool. Thanks for uh, coming. I really appreciate it. I know it's over lunch. I know these things can be a little bit drawn out, so I hope you enjoyed it. Um, real quick, I, I think we only have like a day left in the DevNet zone, but so if you just came here, if this is your first time here, we have workshops, we have demos, we have classrooms, we have learning labs, a whole bunch of fun stuff, all kind of centered around similar ideas to this learning how to use APIs, learning how to code against Cisco infrastructure. So check that stuff out. Um, but thank you guys so much, and uh, have a good afternoon.